Hello and welcome back to Far Beyond the World. We will be continuing where we left off, which, if you recall, is right when Rannoch and the human were on their way to the villa in order to get the last piece of their luggage in order to start their journey to Strambard. And yeah, we found out that it turns out that the dream thingy was just that, a dream. That the Whispers were trying to basically, um, I guess, claim? Calum, but um yeah it didn't work something is preventing that so yeah um well let's continue and see what happens with the whole you know new luggage thing <laughs> we barely left the village and i can already feel the straps digging into my flesh the backpack sits heavily pushing me much harder into the road my feet are killing me but the dress is my main concern with the way the straps brush tightly against my skin, I worry it might tear. Do you really think it's a good idea for me to travel like this? I pull on the rim of my dress with a rather troubled expression. It might be comfortable, but I'm not sure if it's durable enough. Are you kidding? The wolf snorts. It's silk. I don't think there's a more durable cloth out there. Besides, it's not like we have any other options. I'm not about to enter a Tigeri town with a ragged human in tow. Yeah, that would not be a good look for us, would it? Speaking of being ragged, do you think I could get some shoes for the journey? I stop for a moment and wiggle my left foot in jest. I can hardly imagine walking a few days straight barefoot. What's shoes? Yet again, the wolf throws me off with, in hindsight, an obvious question. Um, uh, how would he know what shoes are? Well, it's sort of clothing you put on your feet. Whatever for? To protect them from injury, there's a lot of sticks and pebbles on the ground. I yelp uncomfortably as I step onto one such unlucky stone, causing the wolf to snort. <laughs> Vol's right, you really are a flower. Wolves have been walking barefoot without injuring their pads since the awakening. You just need to step carefully and softly. He tries to lighten his tone so that his comment doesn't come across as chastising, but it's hard not to take it as such. Besides, with your paws covered, how would you feel the vibrations of the ground? It's quite important for alertness. I wouldn't, because I don't. I'm not a wolf. I mumble and slight offense. I get that despite him being humanoid, our point of reference couldn't be more alien to one another, but I don't think I'm being unreasonable. Perhaps I could get some thick cloth to wrap my feet in? This time, it's he who stops, giving me a rather startled look. I'm telling you, it's better than me cutting my feet on something and having you carry me the rest of the way. This little threat seems to have done the trick as he simply nods in reluctant concession. Humans are curious creatures, aren't they? He shakes his head, but his voice carries both amusement and a twinge of awe, empowered by his levelful gaze and a gentle tail swish. Well, you would know best. I try to contain a blush and get us on the move again. It doesn't take long to arrive at the fork where the side path leads towards the villa. We pass between the columns and soon enough we're greeted by the meticulously maintained garden. To no surprise, I can see Bramble and Leaf scurrying about, with the female bunny giving me suspicious gazes as she cuts into the hedge with her scissor. I notice a particularly unruly branch she's measuring, but once she's set to cut it, she diverts her eyes to me. Chomp, and the imperfection is gone. Her intensive gaze and satisfaction on the muzzle leaves no doubt she's imagining my head to be set twig. I cringe moving ever so slightly closer to my wolf. He pays the bunnies no mind and leads us through the porticus, deep into the shade of the atrium. Again, I can't help but gawk open mouth at the magnificence of this room. I have to say, I love this spot so much. I utter quietly, drawing his approving smile. It's so peaceful, and the light dances beautifully on the water's surface. Yeah, I like it too. I used to play here with wooden boats as a pup, imagining the pool to be Lake Tremelin. His soft gaze ventures to the water and he disturbs its surface with his paw, 
causing the nearby water lilies to bounce merrily. I also used to come to think and rest here. It's a good room, but often quite busy. He turns back towards the gardens. This being the entrance and all. I still can't believe you. I feign some offense, giving him a challenging look. Criticizing me for being uppity while you lived in a freaking palace. Lived being the operative tense. He winks and bobs his head inquisitively towards the main hall. I nod and we proceed to enter. Finally, I was about to send someone to fetch you. The chief grumbles in annoyance as we enter the great hall. He's seated with Vidrier at the top table, looking over a stack of papers. I take an informed guess that those are the letters that they were talking about last night. Howl summons. I'm sorry, I had to find out the travel gear and ensure it's in working order. Ranak responds, patting the backpack I'm carrying and drawing an audible oof from me as I'm reminded of the load. When we come to a stop in front of the table, I take the liberty in dropping the bag onto the ground and both wolves look at it with a slight bewilderment. Seems a bit much, doesn't it? Why are you taking the tent? They echo my very own concerns from just a few moments ago, and I look to the wolf with a subtle, what did I say, face. Well, the human is furless and there are still cold nights ahead. Last thing I want is for him to catch something before we even get there. He responds awkwardly, causing the two older wolves to exchange confused gazes. Hmm. Thankfully, a side door cracking open draws their attention and I see Trist walk in with a silver pitcher. We exchange cordial gazes and I wink to him as he passes by. Thank you, but you can take it away. We have a long day ahead of us, and we need to maintain clear heads. The old wolf dismisses the bunny, causing Vithrier to shudder. Come on, not even a little drinky? I'm parched here, and I have a massive headache. He pleads, causing the bunny to stop and observe their ensuing exchange for further instruction. This is a sober job, Vidrier. Tell that to a nail. That crazy old minx nearly drank me under the table. You shouldn't have been drinking last night. The chief sounds unamused, and the brown male protests. She doesn't listen. She asks for a drink, and once she's done with it, she already forgot she had one. I hope she's fine. She's not 80 anymore. You can't treat her like a drinking buddy. He utters through an exasperated sigh, rubbing the ridge above his eyes. Honestly, you should have seen her in the morning. She got up like nothing happened and went home. Not alone, I hope. Of course not. Who do you think I am? Victor scoffs in evident offense. I asked Cora to escort her. Good. You need to be careful with her, is all I'm saying. We can't afford to lose a nail before the howl. Honestly, Varric, it'll take more than a bottle of moonshine to kill her. And I'm not about to chastise a near century old female, telling her what she can and cannot do. Either way, there will be no drinking. The chief again swishes his hand at Trist and the bunny turns on his heel in quite a surprise. I guess stuff is really serious if they forego the booze. But it was amusing listening to Enel's antics. So she's nearly a hundred years old. That is quite impressive. I really cannot help but wonder what she was like in her youth. It must seem to her like a lifetime away. Father, I was wondering if perhaps Triss could aid Kaelin in procuring one last thing we need for our journey. Rhinox steps forward, drawing their expectant gazes, and the chief snaps his fingers, causing the bunny to freeze. Oh, and what would that be? He needs something to cover his feet with. His underpaws are unnaturally soft and prone to injury. I don't think I follow. The old male narrows his eyes, clearly getting impatient with what he perceives as a silly request. Trust me, it'll make our journey go much smoother. Very well. The chief sighs and waves his paw, both at me and the bunny, allowing us to disappear into the side room. What was that about? Trist asks with a rather confused expression. Can you arrange for some robust cloth for me? 
or a thick piece of leather would do. Whatever for? I need to make some bandages to wrap around my feet. Did you cut yourself? No, but I need to protect my souls on the journey. Humans usually don't walk around barefoot. I say, realizing how silly it must sound through his widening smirk. That's a bit fruity. He stifles a chuckle, looking at me with pity. The road would be long and most likely covering difficult terrain. My skin bruises easily. Hmm. I'll see what I can find. Would linen be enough? The bunny proposes and I nod eagerly. It would. Bring anything you've got. Wait here then. He pats my shoulder and leaves through one of the side doors, leading deeper into the complex. I hang around the door, listening on to the conversation, but I'm not getting much out of it. The chief and fifth rear simply list the supplies Rannoch has to secure. Aside from the grains, they also need stale, and a lot of it. I'm also relieved to hear them speak of medical supplies, whose apparent lack troubled me deeply after the conversation with Verissa. But before I can fully on enter my Snoopy mode, the brown bunny returns with my query. Here you go. He lays down an assortment of items on the side table. I found some burlap sacks. They're roughly the size of your feet. The bunny hoists them up into the air and closes one eye to measure them against me. I also have some bandages and the leather you asked for. Thanks, Trist. I owe you one. Two, actually. He winks, clearly hinting at my scavenger hunt from yesterday, and I simply nod in agreement. At first, I wasn't sure how to go about this, but eventually I decide to trace the outline of my foot on the leather piece. The bunny observes as I cut out the shape with a knife, careful not to cut myself whenever the blade slipped against the stubborn pelt. Once I have two floppy soles, I scooch myself onto the counter and try to affix them to the underside of my feet with tight bandages. In this, I need some help, and Triss aids me as best as he can. It takes a short while, but eventually everything is neatly in place and I jump off from the table. It feels amazing not having to endure the cold stone underfoot. My beaming expression draws an amused scoff from the bunny. I must admit, this looks rather peculiar. Triss mutters, watching as I put on one of the burlap sacks. It's quite shallow, and the tie handle secures it tightly around my ankle, almost looking at, like an old-timey shoe. Well, it's not the most comfiest type of footwear, but it does the job. With any luck, I'll find a cobbler in Strambard, and I'll be able to get myself a proper pair. At the very least, they must have sandals. I think out loud, causing the bunny to laugh. You say the darndest of things. You almost sound like my nan. Her mind was never quite there, but near the end, she was babbling nonsense just like you. I'll miss your snarky ass. I smirk at him coyly. I won't miss yours. He teases right back. Your sass with the elders almost beggars belief. Maybe once you're back, I'll finally get to enjoy your execution. Maybe. I wink, restraining myself from returning the joke. Any sort of playful threat of harm would be inappropriate right now towards the bunny. He notices my slight apprehension and waves his paw at me. Don't. He mutters sternly. I don't need your pity. Just keep in mind what we talked about. I nod. I won't. Not after what I heard yesterday. Triss gives me a half-smile and sighs. Just don't die out there, you little freak and deprive you of a front row seat to watch me draw my final breath? Never. I laugh as he bobs my shoulders encouragingly and I decide to return to the main hall. I've been absent long enough. It's amazing how used I got to the soft slapping of my feet across the wood and stone. That sound is now replaced with a subtle ruffling of burlap with each of my steps. I walk up to the center of the room, drawing immediate attention from the chief and Vidrir, who look at me with the resin brows. Now that is the most unusual thing I've seen the entire year, and that includes Vulgar nearly getting neutered by Verissa. He's gonna be a laughing stock. The chief doesn't mirror his friend's levity and gives me a rather aggravated look. 
I bet where he comes from, it's quite normal. Otherwise, he wouldn't need it. Ranak tries to reason on my behalf, and Vedrir shrugs. In all honesty, I think we've wasted enough time on that twerp. The chief nods in agreement. Do you have my letter of recommendation? Here it is, sealed and ready. He passes a sizable envelope to the chief, and the old male nods in satisfaction. Good. Hold it right there! We all jolt up in attention at the now startling familiar screeching. Oh, for the love of a Luna. Cute, Varric. Real cute. The pudgy female wheezes on her way up towards the table. Did you really think that I would miss this? Why wasn't I consulted on Rannoch's apparent diplomatic mission? I'm seriously considering bringing back the day guards at the door. People come in and out of this place as if it were an inn. The chief mutters to Vithrier, paying the old hag no mind. Well? But she would not be ignored and Vithrier leans to his side, resting against the armrest. Not our fault you stormed off before the meeting ended. Or perhaps you waited for the very last moment to bring the matter up. Really? Sending your son to beg and grovel for scraps from your master's table? She takes on a more contemptuous tone than usual and the brown male scoffs. Can hardly call it begging if we're paying for it. Say what you will, but we need supplies. I nod, internally watching as Varric visibly tenses up. He really hates that fat bitch, and with good reason. Better safe than sorry, that's something even you can't argue against. And this perfect waste of the tribe's gold is safe? Ha! First, we need to get the trade rights. The chief shrugs, sorting through the papers in front of him. And as it stands, our wolves are not allowed to use Strambart's market for anything other than personal use. That's where the groveling will come in handy. My, you must really despise your son to submit him to such humiliation. I shudder, hearing a clear growl escape Rannoch's throat, and the female gives him a cautious look, followed by a few steps away. My son will do what he must for our people, and I think it's past time he took on a more official role. That is to say, if you hope to retain your seat. She continues her taunting, but her gaze now ventures to me, and I roll my eyes. Why is this naked monkey here? Are you seriously thinking I would let you send him off just like that? Send him off? The chief blinks in confusion and looks to Vitrir, who only shrugs. Oh, cut the act! I know what you're up to. Getting rid of the evidence just before the howl is exactly the sort of underpodness I would expect of you. He is Rannoch's attendant. The old male reiterates calmly. He's just carrying his load. And what is to prevent your son from misplacing that little whelp somewhere in that accursed Tigeri town? His whim, I suppose. Vitoria shrugs indifferently. Rannoch seems awfully keen on the bugger. Spare me. You know I will press the issue of the hell, and having the human disappear would make any attack on your son moot. You two have planned this. Her voice battles across the marble hall as she thumps her fat foot against the floor. You think your son will take your place, and you want to see your scheming little harlot sit beside him. Not a first time a scheming little harlot would align herself with this chair. Is it? Victor equips at her through a snarl, and the comment feels somewhat personal as Aldris just looks at him dumbfounded. I don't think there's anything we could say to convince you otherwise, so I don't see a point to this conversation. The chief spreads his arms in defeat, but Vitrier gazes at her challengingly. Let us assume the worst. What? What are you talking about? She narrows her brows, the fat on her face squinting her eyes so much that she might have just as well closed them. Let us assume Rannoch will misplace, as you so nicely put it, the human and Strambard. What of it? You have witnesses to confirm that he was here. No one is going to deny his actual existence. His whereabouts are of no relevance to his case, are they? The brown male states and Val, I mean Aldris, clearly struggles with the proposition. 
Damn it, Enel even made me do it. I... Well, he must. She stumped. Her argument proved flawed. There would have to be a cross-examination. Cross-examination? The chief scoffs in amusement. He's a damn mute. Can't even speak a damn word. Might as well question trees. Urgh. What about his debt, then? She spats angrily, looking to me with determination. His debt has to be paid off. Very well. What is it worth? What? The pudgy female blinks in confusion, taken aback by the question. The two weeks he's been here, what is it worth to you? What sort of trickery is this? We're playing ball. Victoria shrugs yet again. It's clear they're done with her. I really have more important things to do right now than quibble with you over some petty nonsense. Everyone lost their moon-damned mind the moment this ape waltzed into our village. That includes you. I... I smile, seeing her at a loss of words. It's clear it's not a sensation she's familiar with, as she quickly switches to anger and waves her finger at them, as if they were naughty children. Now listen here! We are listening. You're just not giving us an answer. What is it worth to you? The brown male reiterates, and she darts her gaze back to the chief, who leans in with a smile. You're an elder. You have much a right to dictate that rate as we do. Give us your estimate. Silence takes over the room as she carefully thinks this over. Every now and then she looks to me and to Rannoch, who has clearly a troubled expression and this gives her an idea. Ten silver a day! Whoa, hold on a moment! Vittori raises his paw in protest, but the chief nods with satisfaction. Done. What? You can't be serious! That's extortion! His surprise equals that of the fat bitch, although I am a bit lost in this conversation. What does it matter when Rannoch will return with a boy in tow? Let it be even 20 silver a day. You're absolutely right! Make it 20 then! She smiles nastily, certain that she has called the chief's bluff, but the male nods in agreement, completely throwing her off. So be it. That brings the total to three talents, am I right? The old male looks to her expectingly, and she nods reluctantly. Perfect. He pats the table. Should the human vanish in a puff of smoke, that's exactly what I'll expect my son to repay. Seems a fair price for his mistake of bringing him in the first place. Wouldn't you agree? I might not know what game you two are playing, but know this, no amount of trickery is going to save you face at the how. The pudgy female sneers, only to draw an indifferent shrug from him. Maybe, but I don't really have time for this. Thank you for the honor of your visit, but now be so kind. And get the hell out of my home! The chief nods towards the door, but she protests. I want to be present for the handling of the treasury. That is none of your concern. The chief can't dispense with it at his leisure. I want to know how much. You'll be able to find that out at a later point. Vittori cuts her off. I assume you'll be able to deduce how much is missing. His taunt doesn't sit well with her, and she begins to simmer. But before she can explode, the chief stands up and speaks with a slightly risen tone. You have tested my limits of patience, and I am afraid that we are at a breaking point. I won't repeat myself. Leave my home, or I'll have Vithrier summon guards and drag you through the courtyard like the trespasser you are. I can see her clenching her fist in anger as she struggles to stifle a growl, but eventually she, she turns around and storms off at a brisk pace as when she came in. Once she's gone, the chief sighs and sits down, looking towards the brown male. I wasn't joking about the guards, by the way. Oh, I know. Vitrer nods. I want two wolves standing at the entry, night and day, controlling the ingress and egress of people. No matter who comes, they're to report to Trist, and Trist is to check back with me. Unless it's either of those two. He growls softly under his breath. As far as they're concerned, I might be dead, but I don't want them here uninvited. 
Understandable. Anyway, where were we? Ah, yes, the letter. The chief bops in turn towards Rannoch, who approaches and takes a hold of it. I'm not sure how much my name is worth in Strambard nowadays, but I hope that should a need arise, it'll be of some use to you. I'll try not to diminish it, father. What could be worse than obscurity? The old man chuckles, pushing a large wooden box towards my wolf. Here, take a good look. Guarded with your life. He says rather sternly, and I observe as Rannoch carefully lifts up the lid. Almost like in a movie, the hall floods with a golden shimmer, and powered by the sunlight creeping in from various windows. Holy shit! I find myself exclaiming at Rannoch, spurned by the sight of more gold than I ever have imagined. It's all arranged into slender, glimmering bars adorned with the familiar Celtic knot motif packed tight into the chest. I'm sure I would have been utterly terrified at the slip of the tongue, had I not still reeled from the glimpse of unimaginable riches glowing right in front of me. I'll pretend I didn't hear that. The chief grumbles, narrowing his eyes at me as I cover my mouth. Puts a dent in the whole noble theory if a mere case of ingots gets him this excited. Vittori adds rather sternly, causing Rannoch to finally flinch in my defense. I guess the wolf was equally as shocked that I spoke up, as I currently am. It's just a phrase. He's not dumb after all. He's just picking things up with each day. Precisely. The advisor cuts Rannoch off, looking at me with the same penetrative gaze I've seen before. Least said, soonest mended. But the chief dismisses the whole thing with a wave of his paw, and I can almost feel myself and Rannoch internally releasing deep sighs of relief. Vitri nods at his friend's wishes and simply regards the case of gold on the table. There's 32 bars, altogether worth, I'd say, 1,300 talents. I still think it's a bit much. The chief's voice is filled with concern as he reluctantly glances over the treasure. I wouldn't say so. Perfect amount to establish credit, especially if we want to have a favorable accommodation. Hmm. Very well. The old male nods and looks to his son sternly. Deposit it at the town hall. The treasurer should provide you with coin in turn. Spend it wisely, as we'll expect a full accounting upon your return. In other words, don't be too frivolous. Vittori glances towards me with an oddly serious expression as if he was implying something. Wouldn't dream of it. Rannoch responds almost immediately, clearly offended at the suggestion, and his father nods, satisfied with the answer. Right. Do you remember what we talked about? Yes. My wolf responds quietly, and I dart my gaze between them. So, you don't need a refresher? The chief asks, forcing a solemn shake of Rannoch's head. Good. You know what to do. I'll see the magistrate and secure those trade rights. You better do, otherwise we're fucked. Vitro shifts uncomfortably in his chair, looking towards the pantry. With a clap of his paws, the brown male draws Trist back into the main hall. Now. He nods to the bunny and we both look in surprise as he quickly rushes back into the side room only to emerge with two sizable linen parcels. Cora insisted on preparing your provisions. Should last you two nights in case you come up empty-handed. That's very thoughtful of her. Rannoch takes hold of the packages, echoing my very own sentiment. Indeed, she's very taken by you. Do not disappoint her. Wouldn't dream of it. Good. That's it then. The chief rubs his paws together and chooses away. Off you go. Make us all proud. My wolf nods and approaches the table, shutting close the chest and locking it securely with a pad. To my surprise, the box has a leather strap attached to it, which allows it to be thrown over one's shoulder and carried like a side bag. My chief. Rannoch takes a deep bow, then nodding slightly towards the brown male, and I decide to do the same. Vithrir. We back slowly away from the hall, only turning our backs once we're in the atrium proper. Rannoch stops near one of the lounges, placing down his heavy load. That was a bit careless of you. 
he utters in a semi-harsh tone. I'm sorry, I was just taken aback by, well, this. I point to the wooden chest and he sighs. It's fine, they didn't seem to mind. Do you think they suspect? I ask, not really sure what to make of their indifference. I don't know, but I don't think it matters now. He says in a hushed tone and looks cautiously back towards the hall. I stand awkwardly to the side, not sure what to say as he's correcting the fastening of the chest. Once he has it adjusted, he hoists the gold onto his arm again and we proceed to leave. At first I thought he might have been cross with me, but he quickly smiles back, clearly happy to be on the way. I decide to wait until we leave the villa grounds entirely until I speak up again. No point running my mouth with the bunnies watching, especially Leaf. She's really dead set on sending me spiteful gazes. Truth be told, she reminds me of Trist in that sense. But unlike him, she has no actual reason to dislike me. So why is she staring me down so intently? But in all honesty, I don't care. I have bigger problems to worry about, and right now, even they have to take a back seat. I finally get to leave this place and explore the world, even if it's just for a little bit. It's exactly what we talked about those very first few days. When we veer onto the road, I take a deep, exaggerated breath. That meeting was oddly cold and abrupt. Then again, how can I blame them when the fat bitch pops up everywhere like a jack-in-the-box? A what? He snorts in amusement at another word he might not understand. You know, one of those mechanical toy things that has a puppet on a spring that leaps out of a box when you open it? You really are a noble. He continues to chuckle, causing me to shake my head. How are your shoes, my lord? They're all right. I wiggle my foot teasingly. The leather soles slip every now and then, but a gentle tap with the side of my foot pushes it back in place. I state, but his confused expression betrays he has no idea what I'm talking about. Anyway, I'm sorry about the slip-up. Forget about it. He waves his paw at me. With everything happening, I don't think they even care. They have lots of important things to deal with. Summoning a howl isn't something we do lightly. He says in a serious tone. In fact, the last one took place when I was just a pup. I bet they're making sure that they have all their bases covered. Is it true what your father said at the feast? That if the elders remove him, Vidir would take his place? I guess. The wolf shrugs in equal doubt. I was surprised for them to speak of it so openly. Before it was simply an unspoken assumption, there really is no one else as popular or prominent as Vithrir. If the Howl had to choose a replacement, it would most likely be him. Which would mean that you wouldn't be the heir anymore? I say that in a rather concerned tone, but he seems almost to lighten up at the prospect. Perhaps. Not gonna lie, that would be nice. But Dreyer is no leader, and even if Vithrir would appoint him as his successor, Hal would never consent to it. Especially not with the current situation, a chief must have a clear successor, and both should be figures others look up to. So, who would become chief after Vithrir? Rannoch falls silent, and he might as well have given me an answer. Oh... You're kind of trapped, aren't you? I mutter gently, but he only sighs. We are all born with a single destiny and a purpose in life, both written in the stars long before we were even conceived. No schemes and plots couldn't do that. I was born to rule, and even if my father would be disgraced and Vithrir would take over, eventually my destiny would find a way to correct the course. It's good to see that you're at peace with that. I even admire it. I nod approvingly. You do seem to be born to lead. You command respect, loyalty, and devotion of those around you. Vol, Verissa, even Vergara will follow you to the end. I saw the way that she looked at you at the feast. I'd rather not relive that if that's okay with you. He says completely deflated, almost tucking his tail in. The things Vergara admires me for are not the things that I'm proud of which is another reason why you'll make a great chief. You won't be ruthless or cruel. 
I try to encourage him, but he doesn't seem convinced. I'm glad you say that, but life is never as easy as that. And you were right yesterday. If there is something that I learned this week, is that I will do anything to protect those around me. That includes being ruthless and cruel, if needs be. The wolf says in a rather cold tone, something I never experienced from him thus far. He's serious, and it's clear that he has thought it through. The idea of having to become what he must become to defend his loved ones weighs heavily on him, and I just placed my hands on his shoulder. But, can we not dwell on this? He asks with a quivering voice and I nod. We have a long road ahead of us, and I'd rather we focus on the scenery. It's your opportunity to see Ternan in all its glory. Oh, I don't think anything could top what I saw yesterday. That, to me, was Ternan in all its glory. I say in a surprisingly confident and seductive tone, which even takes me aback. What? The wolf just stops and stands there, gawking at me in embarrassment, and I decide to continue as if nothing happened. I swing my hips side to side, as if I were in a catwalk, bustering all the provocativeness in my gait that I can pull off without being comical. Eventually, I hear him clear his throat and rush after me. I allow his stride to bring him back to my side, and he clears his throat once again, trying to play it cool. I'm glad you enjoyed the view. Wish I dropped the coin. It's a sight I definitely want to revisit. His stunned and flustered expression finally makes me snort ungracefully, and I begin to chuckle. If you'd only seen your face. Hey. He mumbles uncomfortably. Don't make fun of me like that. Who said I'm making fun? I lean onto his arm, wrapping my hands around it. Although the timing might have been off, I want you to know that I very much enjoyed anything that did or didn't happen. I find myself saying gently with a heartfelt honesty, and he smiles. So did I. He muses through a toothy grin. You're surprisingly attractive, considering the lack of fur. My eyes open wide at his off-handed compliment. One would expect a furless creature to look like a sick pup. Yeah, I get it. I cut him off rather harshly and pull away. Damn, your game really flew out the window there. For a moment, I really feel offended, but it takes just a second for my humor to return and I laugh out loud. Didn't know you were into sick pups. Now you make it sound creepy. He takes his turn being offended and I continue to laugh. Not my fault that you need to work on your comparison game. So what would humans say for s how smooth you are? We'd say one's skin is as soft as a baby's. I almost choke at the realization. You know what? Never mind. Fuck poetic license. Most of it ends up creepy in retrospect. And with that, he laughs away as we continue through the next few hundred meters just smiling and enjoying the morning stroll. The fresh air and the dewy scent of the woods really lightens up my mood. And I need to keep it up as it doesn't take long for my body to start straining under the weight of all the baggage I'm carrying on my back. But I won't complain. After all, Rannoch is carrying god knows how much gold in that trunk. Still, the presence of such treasure fills me with slight unease. Do you think it's wise that we're traveling with all that wealth alone? What do you mean? The wolf asks, raising his brow. Don't you fear that we could be ambushed, or... By whom? He cuts me off and his voice takes on a more mocking tone. The immediate area is patrolled by our packs. Currently, Vol and Varys's wolves. Further beyond the outer alphas maintain order. You're safe here. He tries to sound reassuringly, but I keep looking at him with a rather unconvinced expression. Even if we were to be attacked, do you think some downtrodden unfortunate could beat me in combat? Mm, no. I can see through a sigh and snort at the fact that I almost sound disappointed. We're safe within turn, and you have my word for it. What about beyond? The road to Strambart is desolate and speckled with impoverished farmsteads. If you're a highwayman and you're operating there, 
you really don't understand the meaning of highway behind your profession's name. He states snarkily, and I can't help but laugh at his observation. Hmm, true. So, how much exactly is three talents? I ask idly, toying with the idea of my very own price tag. Way too much. The wolf huffs, and I give him a worried look he clearly misreads, judging by his panicked reaction. Not that you aren't worth every penny, but... He sighs, rubbing his neck awkwardly. That amount is something that would take a ward three years to repay. Trist's own debt is set at seven talents, and he incurred it on behalf of his entire borough. Oh. I mumble awkwardly, looking to the ground while the wolf continues in a defeated tone. Paying that will set me back quite a bit. I meant to use my money to pay off Trist, but now that seems quite unlikely. Well, you don't have to pay it, though, right? I ask a bit confused by his sudden sad expression. I don't intend to run off over there. Oh, uh, yeah, of course. He quickly straightens up and shakes his head dismissively. I wasn't suggesting that at all, but we'll have to settle that debt eventually. Hmm. I narrow my brows. Something feels off about his erratic behavior, but I decide to let it be for now. Anyway, enough of that. The wolf waves his paw at me and comes to a stop. What's the matter? I wanted to show you something before we depart. He nods off trail and leads me towards the greenery. We walk through quite a thicket, and I try my best to brush off all the straight branches and leaves. The heavy load I carry does not make the task any easier, but at least the improvised shoes come in handy, and I sally forth without a whimper, seeing Ranok brave through with his own payload. It takes some time to push to where he wants us to go, but eventually, he stops me with a gentle pat on my shoulder. We're here, he says in a hushed voice as he brushes aside the last bushes with his paw. I stop dead in my tracks, with jaw dropping to my chest as I look upon his very own name tree. And that's where I'm going to leave it for today. <laughs> um... So, yeah, I'm going to leave it on the name tree. And then on Friday, you get to see the rest. Because I'm just like that. I like to tease you guys and stuff. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, this is where Rannoch found the human. Right in front of this tree, all covered in blood and viscerer. Vi vi what is it called? Viscerer? Viscerer? Not viscerer. Um, viscera. Yeah. But anyways, um, so we went to the villa, got a box of gold bars, and the human has shoes now. <laughs> um, also, there seems to be something fishy going on with Rannoch. And I have a feeling, and I hope that's not true, but I have a very big suspicion that Rannoch plans to leave the human in Strambard. Because it would be a very convenient thing to do. Because, I mean, if you... Assuming that the human is from this world. Which he probably isn't. Um, it would be a good idea to just drop him off with, you know, the tigers. Or humans, you know, whoever are there. That could just take him back to the main capital or whatever. Wherever he might be from. And, you know, that fixes the whole problem of, you know, there's a human in, in, in Ternan. He's not supposed to be there, and the Howl is meant to call all the Alphas back, and given, um, that might be very bad, you know, because he's not supposed to be there. All of them are probably going to call for his head the first thing, and Aldris was planning on making him, like, the, the main highlight of the Howl instead of, you know, the actual impending war. So, I guess it would make sense to just ditch him but i mean could ranok actually do that and that also brings to mind what uh varissa said where she said that ranok you know he he'll be able to do it when it you know when push comes to shove and i'm assuming that means you know again ditching the human uh 
that that kind of sucks actually like your your best friend slash kind of sort of not really but maybe boyfriend is planning to leave you behind that's a very uh, like very romantic movie or um where it's like oh I, i'm no good for you whatever so they get to a city and then the other person leaves them there but then eventually that other person's going to end up running back and finding the person and see so like, why did you come back? Or whatever. Anyways, um, but yeah. Um, that's what I'm foreseeing. That Ranok is going to try to leave the human in Strambard. Which, I mean, that that's kind of very sucky. Come on, Ranok, you can't do that to the human. You're technically his boyfriend. <laughs> um, nothing is stopping you from, you know, doing your duty of, you know, spreading some wild oats Well. Also, being with your human. You just have to do it once with someone else, and then you can go back to your human. And I'm, I'm pretty sure Kaylin will understand. Um, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, anyways, um, so what do you guys think? Do you think that Rannoch will leave him? Do you think that there will be an issue once they reach Strambard, where, you know, they're like, well, why are you here? We can't give you credit here, you know. That, you know, Rannoch will have to do a lot of groveling in order to get the supplies that they need or something. Mm, so, yeah, leave your comments down in the, you know, down in the comment section. And I know you're all itching to see the finale of this uh, update, but, you know, you just have to wait until Friday. And, yeah, so... Uh, thank you all for watching slash listening. If you would like to play Far Beyond the World yourself and find out what happens... Um, at the end of this update, uh, you can find it over on itch. And if you would like to support the project, you can um, support them over on Patreon, and I will all obviously put a link down for that. And if you would like to follow Kale Tiger's Twitter and get a link for you know the visual novel, because you know I can't put I can't put uh, itch links, especially uh, far beyond the world links. Um, I will put a link down for his Twitter. And if you aren't already uh, a part of the Discord for Far Beyond the World, then, you know, go looking for it. <laughs> I'm not going to put a link down for that. I don't know if I can or can't. So, yeah. And I guess that's it for now. And I will see you guys on Friday for the conclusion of the update. Hopefully, because I, I don't know if I have something going on. <laughs> so, yeah. Bye-bye. Uh,